Are there any unicorns here? Be proud. Okay, more than one. All right. So um, imagine that you're at a party. Oh, there it is. Imagine that you're at a party with a bunch of web developers and a few normal people, and somebody says this. And by the way, these monitors down here aren't working, so forgive me for looking at what's happening. So somebody says that, and then they say that. And then they say this, which you've all heard, right? How hard can it be? So now imagine what you are thinking at this party. <laughs> and you've all heard this. So then he goes, okay, well then what do you have to know? And this is where it gets interesting because of course every single person at this event, whether they're a web developer or not, has an opinion about this. So they all start talking and they all start giving their ideas about what you really have to know. I mean, you absolutely cannot call yourself a web developer if you don't have these things, whatever it is. But they're all starting to argue about it because they don't all agree. And I'm not making fun of Node, by the way, just a little bit. Um, so there starts to be this argument among even this very small group of people. So if we can't agree on what you have to know, then we will ask the experts. Because who else is going to tell us? And so this is what they say. You absolutely cannot call yourself a developer if you don't at least know all of those things right now. So um, you have to be a rock star, as every ad will tell you. Um, you have to be a ninja. You have to be a hacker. You have to be a hacker ninja. <laughs> and the internet is wrong, spoiler alert. Um, so if you ask 10,000 people, you get 10,000 different opinions on what you have to know to be a web developer at any given time. So this should be comforting, because it means there is no one answer at all. But the people who say these things, especially the people on Hacker News, they know. They are firm in their commitment. But they don't actually know. They just think they do. So what do you have to know? That is the wrong question. So a better question is, you know you are going to have to learn stuff. So how fast can you do that? How much and how fast can you do that and still survive? Well, it starts here. There are three kinds of developers. There's human. There's, of course, the unicorn. And there's humanoid. And the problem is humanoids have consistently available, always up, cognitive resources, perfect memory, et cetera, et cetera. Humans, their cognitive resources are so scarce and precious and limited. I'm not going to talk about unicorns because you don't exist. So you've, uh, you've been mistaken for a humanoid. Everything, every almost every, 99.9%, because .9 someone's going to go, not all open source documentation treats me like this. Um, everything treats you like a humanoid. Probably your boss, your employers, your clients, school, everything you've ever done, every book um, that's helped you learn to program, including potentially mine, have treated you like a humanoid and not a human. So. A little refresher on cognitive resources, because that's the perspective that we're going to use, because it is the only key you have to actually learning really quickly and really well. So most of you are probably familiar with this, but just a little refresher. So this was one of the experiments that really started it all. Um, so I'll imagine that I split the room. And this half of the room, I give you an, a little memory test. And it only has two digits. You just have to memorize two digits. Pretty easy. This whole side of the room, seven digits. Not seven numbers, just seven digits, pretty easy. So I give you that test, give you that test. Then you're all done, and the researcher says, can you come down the hall for, you know, for further processing? The experiment is over, but of course it's never over. And then they say, oh, by the way, would you like a snack? And you're offered fruit or cake. So I think you probably all know what happens. This side of the room, you guys chose a lot more cake. These are the really slim fruit eaters. So um, the difference was just five extra digits. That's how much it took. So again, at first they thought, well, it's just about the glucose in the brain, which has something to do with that. But really, what they learned is that it's all one tank. Cognitive processing for solving problems, for thinking, doing the hard stuff, and willpower 
all the same tank. One pool of resources, burn one, you burn the other. And it works with dogs, too. So for example, this is actually my dog. Um, it, they did these experiments with different breeds of dogs. Take a dog and have it sit, just sit obediently. Just, just sit, doesn't have to do anything but sit. Take another dog and it has to go in the crate for 10 minutes. At the end of 10 minutes, they released the dogs to play one of those treat puzzles, which they had cruelly rigged so it actually couldn't ever be solved by the dog. And then they waited to see how long the dogs would work on that puzzle. So the dogs that had to sit in the crate worked on that puzzle twice as long as the dogs that just had to sit obediently. So think about that if you have a dog, right? Your dog just sitting there is burning through self-control cognitive resources and then can't think. And whereas sitting in the crate required no use of cognitive resources, the dog was able to, in self-control, the dog was able to use them all to solve the puzzle. So think about this. If you are doing anything in your own products or services or anything that you make for other people, think, am I doing things that are unnecessarily burning people's cognitive resources? Am I doing things that will make them choose cake? And often we are. And so this is a problem. So the goal is to reduce cognitive leaks all the time and to always remember it is one tank and it is so scarce and so easily depleted. So again, here's how it works. Right? Even if you're doing something that you like to do, even if you're doing something, it's not about doing something that you hate. It's about actually just using your brain to think. So, but if this happens, right, then you have less ability to resist the drive through on the way home. And it works in reverse. You've all had a client or a boss say that. Um, you can just do that today, right? Now, what you're thinking is something like this. But what you actually say is, sure, no problem. Now, if you say, sure, no problem, instead of what you really think, you just burned a lot more cognitive resources. Which is why when you think about it, it really makes no sense for people to hold all the kinds of meetings they hold, because every meeting that you attend, most of the time, is bleeding your cognitive resources dry. So when you go back and try to work, right, you can't function. So you, you tell the client, sure, no problem, when you're thinking, gosh, if you could only die in a fire, then you can't play chess that night. This is how it works. And there are a gazillion studies that support this. It's all one tank. But it's not just these big things, right? There's a death by a, cogn uh, a thousand cognitive micro leaks, all the tiny little things. Those could be tiny little things in an interface, just tiny little things that you have to deal with. So here's an example. Anyone have an Apple TV remote? Right. Anyone here not lost it in the cushions? So, this thing is so tiny, right? So this is what people end up doing. <laughs> they do it so much that this is what I entered as the search string. <laughs> people taping their Apple remote to bigger things because that's what I had to do. And there are so many, there was even a Kickstarter, right? So <laughs> it's not about the lost time looking for the remote. It's the, it's the tiny little cognitive resources all the time. And so people try to find these solutions so that they don't have to waste cognitive resources on them. But those things add up to a huge pool. So think about all the little things they matter. So what we know is that where there is high expertise, there is a great deal of cognitive resource management for efficiency when learning and efficiency and effectiveness when actually doing the thing. So that's what we're going to look at, is how to get way better, way faster, from a cognitive resources perspective, because without that, nothing you do will matter. So this is the framework that we're going to look at. Right? Imagine you have three boards with post-it notes. One is for the things that you um, can't do but will need to. The next is for things that you can do with effort. These are the things that are burning cognitive resources. And then the last is for things that have moved into the automatic, mastered, possibly unconscious stage. So the goal is to always be moving things across that board. But there are a bunch of problems. So we're going to look real quick at these three main problems and how to solve them. So the first one is you just don't get better. When people don't make progress, the main reason usually comes down to this pile up on B. There's just too many things draining cognitive resources. Now, you just saw that experiment with the two and the seven, how just five extra digits overwhelmed your cognitive resources. It takes so little. 
And here you are trying to learn so many things. So the pileup on B is there are too many cognitive resources being drained to ever effectively nail something and get it over to the C pile. So problem number two is the intermediate blues. This is when someone is making progress, and then they just plateau. Something happens, and they just can't seem to get any better. And the main reason for that is usually that something has made it to C, but it's not high quality, or it's not supporting them, or maybe it's outdated, and now it's holding them back, and it once worked, whatever it is. But now it may even be unconscious. And if not unconscious, it's something that doesn't take any cognitive resources, which was the point, so nobody wants to pull it back and refine it. So we'll look at that. And problem number three is it just takes too long. We don't have that kind of time. Not when, you know, Quora and Reddit and Stack Overflow and Hacker News is telling us everything we need to learn. So we have to fix those things. So we have to fix pile up on B, half-assed on C. These are actually relatively simple to fix, especially pile up on B. This would change your life if you really started doing it like today. Um, the too slow, we're going to look at that because that's the one where all the magic happens. So pile up on B, we need to fix that because we have a bad balance. Too many things taking cognitive resources so you can't just ever finally nail something and get it off the cognitive resource plate. So there are a couple things you can do. There's the obvious one, but this is not always easy to do, especially when other people are driving what you're supposed to be learning, is you just keep more stuff on A. You don't try to learn it, right? You don't have to learn the whole API right now. You can do it in pieces. But the main thing we can do, and this is what you know, 50 years of research on expertise development has told us, split these things into small subtasks, subskills, and take those small subskills to C. And then suddenly, you become a lot more effective and efficient. That's how you move through getting better. Now, how do you know what size of a subskill actually is going to help make that process happen? So, and this is the thing to remember, half a skill beats a half ass skill. Um, the way that you can tell, this is one way you can tell, there are many ways, but this is one way that is a really simple way, is if you can take a skill from you can't do it to mastered like maybe 95% of the time that you try it, you get it right. Within three sessions and each practice session, it, within one to three sessions, and each session is no more than 45 to 90 minutes. If you can't, if you haven't done, if you haven't nailed this thing, You've just got it in that amount of time. The thing is too big. So you need a finer grained skill so that you can just keep moving them along. That's how progress happens. And, but it's, you can see it's not what we normally try to do. So but here's a bigger problem that this helps fix. The scariest thing about practicing with a bunch of stuff on B, a bunch of stuff that you just you keep working on it, you keep working on it, you keep working on it, you haven't really nailed it, you know, you're getting better, but you're still crappy at it, is that practice makes permanent. So whatever you practice, the longer you practice being crappy at it, or, be, or even just being a beginner, the better you get at staying a beginner or mediocre. So it's really important to take fewer things and very quickly pass through that stage and jump up to intermediate as quickly as you can. Now, half-ass skills on C, this one, um, the biggest problem is that we don't ever want to revisit those things. And when they study very high expertise, they find people who are continually rechecking the things they've already automated and mastered to see. Does this need to be refined? Does this still serve me? Does the, it, you know, is this causing me to now hit a limit and I can't go any further? So consider what those things are. But think about what's on your C board right now. And these can be big things, little things, things you do, things you know, right? Um, I'm just going to admit this. I've never admitted this before. But um, I've been programming almost 30 years. And I just started using an IDE two weeks ago. I have been, well, I considered Sublime. That was my big upgrade to an IDE. Um, I've been using TextEdit in the command line. So I find IntelliJ, yes. Um, and after about two days, I'm like, I'm killing myself of how many cognitive resources I will never recover not doing this. But it was just easier, right? I just did what I did. So programming paradigm, right? Now we're in the OOFP thing. Coding style semicolons, typing, whatever it might be, um, how you hold a stylus for your graphic designer, all of those things could be anything. But think about bringing it back. Now, that takes cognitive resources to do it, but this is the most effective use of your cognitive resources if you want to keep getting better. So, but 
if it's too slow, how does this help you? You can be doing everything right, moving things across the board, but it's too slow. And for you folks, it probably doesn't get more challenging for how fast you have to learn new things than for you, the people in this room. So, how, um, like I'm telling you something you don't know. So, um, we need to bypass B where we can. Because if you can go straight from can't do it to suddenly you just magically can, how awesome is that? And we can. And we also want to speed up A to B to C. So it all starts here. This is the most extreme example, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, but just for a refresher. The most extreme example of something that bypasses C, where you go from I can't do it to I'm an absolute expert, and I have no idea how I got there. So chicken sexing, determining the gender of a baby chick. Apparently, there are certain kinds of chickens where that, it's virtually impossible to perceive it. Now, obviously, it's not impossible for the brain, but it's impossible for the people who are actually trying to figure it out. But people become really, really good at it. So in Japan, they took a group of people and said, these are the master chick sexers. We will have them teach other chick sexers. And so they tried, and they couldn't. Because either they didn't know what rules they were actually using or how they were actually doing it, or they were just guessing. So they couldn't teach people. So instead, they did something else. And this is where it all happens. <laughs> this, is the, this is the template. Even though this is very simplified, it scales up to things much more complex. They took the people who were going to learn to be chick sexers, and they just, here's the bin of chicks. And they would just pick up a chick and say, I don't know, female. And the, the chick sexer expert would say, yes, no, yes, no. And the person was just doing it randomly, just sorting them. I have no idea. Yeah, male, female. Over time, their responses were not random. They got better and better and better and better, and given enough time, became experts without ever knowing how they suddenly got better. So again, that's the most extreme example. Another one was the World War II um, civilian plane spotters in England. There were people who got to be really good at a crucial skill, which is knowing, is that incoming plane a bomber? Or is that one of our own? So again, they tried to have those expert plane spotters teach others, couldn't do it. They didn't actually know what rules they were using. Or every time they said they had a set of rules, something about that there would be, you know, exceptions to those rules that made it all fall apart. So they did the same thing with the chick sexers. They just had the person who wanted to learn next to the expert, and they created new expert plane spotters that way. Brains do things all the time. But the best things the brain does have nothing to do with us. We don't get to have a say. And this is what drives us crazy about people who really do have a lot of expertise. When you say things like, well, how did you know? How did you do that? How did you figure that out? Right? They just they don't know. They just know. And all of you have things that you have deep expertise at where this is true for you. The problem is we often think we know even when we don't. So those were simple tasks, right? The chicken sexing and the plane spotting. Well, extremely difficult, but very simple in terms of identification. What about more elaborate things? Because we're talking about development. So here's an experiment that was done with NASA and some people from UCLA. Pretty spectacular. In fact, it's kind of shocking how few people have actually really looked at this. They took, um, uh, these are the, any pilots in here? So this is the six pack, the, the instrument, the flight instruments. They took non-pilots, not beginning pilots, people who have never actually even thought about flying a plane, and they put them through this training program. Lasted about two hours. Very special training program, very much like the chick sexing, right? This is what happened. They outscored the seasoned pilots with 1,000 to 2,000 hours of flight time. Non-pilots on accuracy and speed of knowing what those instruments meant in terms of the plane. So that's really dramatic. They didn't even have any teaching at all. They went straight from A to C. And then they did it again with an aviation um, uh, navigation task. Same thing. This is order of magnitude, right? Now, could they, could they leave and fly a plane? No, but they had just learned two really crucial skills that no longer have to drain cognitive resources. And oh, yes, they're really awesome at it because it's a really life-saving skill, too. So they just jumped way up the curve. So no, you can't learn everything that way, but you can learn so many more things than people believe. So it's not used. This is actually called perceptual learning. 
So that's the reason it's not used, is because for so long, really the 60s is when a lot of this, 1960s, a lot of this research started, um, and it's robust, is they believed that it was just about sensory perception. They just thought it was about what the eyes saw or, or heard, that it, or even kinesthetic. They didn't realize that the brain was pattern matching also on deep underlying structures and patterns and rules, that it wasn't just about sensory perception. So why we're not using this is um, crazy. So um, brains are great at pattern matching if we get out of the way. But they don't tell us that they're doing it, which is why you have these experts who have absolutely no idea how they do certain things. And you, know, you, you may have encountered someone, or you may yourself, look at some code for just a second without really studying it and go, that code smells bad, right? We use words like that, smells bad. You may not yet know why, but you are certain it does. So that's an example of your brain has pattern matched in a way that you aren't even cognitively aware of yet. Although you could dig into the code and find out why. Now, this is the answer to how to make it happen, is high quality, high quantity examples. And this is what we don't do. It has to be very high quantity, of all high quality examples. And we don't do that. We see one example, we see two examples, we see three examples in a book or a course or on a website, right? To actually get that order of magnitude jump, it takes about 200 to 300 exposures in a very compressed period of time. That allows the brain to sort signal from noise. So that's where the magic happens. And we can do this as a community. And I've been trying to look, and it is really hard to find really good quality examples in such high numbers. But they can be very small, right? Teaching a very small subset, or I shouldn't say teaching, letting the brain figure out the pattern. But to sort signal from noise, the example set has to be huge. Otherwise, the brain, we see this, the brain looks at one example and thinks, well, maybe that's important too. And it mistakes surface details for the core underlying pattern. So the answer is, we have to care about each other's cognitive resources. So right now, I just want you to <laughs> look around at the people next to you. Right now, I'm going to sit here until you do. You can't leave until you do. Look around at the people next to you and realize that they are not humanoids. <laughs> they are not unicorns. They're humans. <laughs> and just visualize them bleeding cognitive resources <laughs> and think about how you can help them and they can help you. And being at this event is really a great way to do that. And the next time somebody says this to you, right, the only reasonable response is that's adorable. And um, I just want to honor that you are all humans, and your, your cognitive resources are scarce and precious, and thank you so much for spending some of them on me. Thank you. <laughs>